Welcome to a Celtic State of Mind. I'm Paul John Dykes, and today I'm joined by Kevin Graham for Kevin's show, which is Screamer Celica. It's a play on words from the seminal primal scream album Screamer Delica. Kevin, what's the show all about? The show is about music and football, my two great passions after family, obviously. So I pick an album from a certain year and I look back on what Celtic were doing at that time. We speak about the album, then I have my two Catching the Butterfly moments. So the Catching the Butterfly, obviously it's a verse song, but it also re re relates to the chaos theory of the butterfly effect. What was I want to call it? The Pete Best the moment. Pete Best it's moment. like the sliding doors moment. Sliding doors moment. Sliding doors moment. It? Yes. So we have a look at what actually happened during that period. What actually happened with the album, then we fire in the catching the butterfly. What moment. might have been. What might have been. If one small part had changed how the world would be a completely different place. Now, the thing is, I, I do like that. Because you, your mind works in parallel universe terms all the time, doesn't it? And, mm -hmm. you know, it's one of these things where regards to back in the day, you used to get like annoyed if you were in a traffic jam. But now I'm of the view that you're being delayed for a reason. Mm -hmm. You know, it's all to do with, you know, the path that you're on kind of thing. Nothing and then, is coincidence. Nothing is coincidental. You're right. Mm -hmm. So you do have a look at that and what if this, what if that. And it's true and it's actually quite interesting when you start uh, looking at the, the possibilities of uh, what might have been, especially when you look at Celtic. There's so many possibilities. I don't want this season to be one of those, Kevin, when we look back, what if Barkas and Duffy uh, came good? I'm hoping to, to look back and say, when they came good, that's when everything started turning around. So tell us what era you're taking us back to, what's the month and date, and what is the album that we're going to be talking about after we look at Celtic back then? So the, this album was released on the 9th of May 2005 uh, on Liverpool's famous Viper label. Now, May 2005 is no a happy time to, for a Celtic fan to remember. On the 9th of May, we're two weeks away from Black Sunday. After Black Sunday on the 25th of May, Martin O'Neill announces that he's leaving the club. Mm. We do win the Scottish Cup on the 28th of May. Uh, and a couple of days after that, we appoint Gordon Strang. So May 2005 is a time of reflection, basically, for the Celtic fans. It's a time of heartache and reflection. So the album that I'm going to look at at that point, at this point, is by Scouse, a guy that we big up on this show all the time. He's a magician, he's a musician, he's a singer, he's a songwriter, he's a bona fide genius, which is Edgar Summertime Jones. Mm. And he released the album Soothing Music for Stray Cats on the 9th of May 2005. He certainly did. It, it's a fantastic album, and we'll go on and speak about the album. Um, hopefully, people are looking up the album at this precise moment in time, and also watching the acoustic session that he done with us a we'll, couple of weeks ago. We'll need released, to speak about that. That yeah. we released a couple of weeks ago. Mm. But back to the football. Aye, May 2005, no happy time for us. Um, we had one at Ibrox, then we collapsed, basically. Uh, the last five games of that season, we got absolutely, we got absolutely ripped at Celtic Park by a young Scott Brown, and Hibs beat us three one, and it brought us to that dreadful day at Fir Park. Mm -hmm. um, losing somebody the, the magnitude of Martin O'Neill, it was always going to be a tough act to follow. But Dermot Desmond was good friends with Gordon Stratton, and I must admit, I wasn't uh, as against Gordon Stratton coming in, as some of the Celtic support were at that time. I thought Stratton had a decent enough record with Southampton. And what, what, what I probably didn't realise at that time was that Gordon Stratton was going to come in and see a massive change in the structure of the way the club done its business. Uh, we were heavily Downsizing. We were downsizing. Yeah. We were heavily at debt at that point. And I think the sign of the future to come was the fact is Gordon, can you remember who Gordon Stratton's first signing was? Let me think back. Stratton's first signing. Now I remember some of his early ones. Telfer, uh, Virgo, Jeremy Aliadier, um, 
obviously I've not got it right yet. Give no. me a clue. Was it on loan Arthur Boric? No, it was a free signing from Burnley. It wasn't a Kamara. It was no Kamara. Was it? Is that his no. first signing? Maybe we should have maybe the warning sign should have came up right away when his first signing was Mo Kamara for Burnley. Wow. Um so he was appointed the first of June. He not, was an energetic player. That's that's as much as I can muster. He was an energetic player was Mo Kamara. That's been kind of energetic. Now appointed on the first of June, replacing Probably, if people would argue, the second greatest manager in our history. Then your first competitive game's Bratislava. And a 5 nothing defeat. A horrendous defeat. A game that we were still in at 2 nothing until you make two substitutions and we end up 5 nothing done. Mm. A result that puts you at the Champions League. Your first... Your, your first big test since... Black Sunday, basically. So, in the space of three games, in the space of a couple of months, you've lost a league title that you should never have lost against a team that you bet seven times that previous year. A poor, poor Rangers side. Mm -hmm. When we look back on it, mm -hmm. you then lose your greatest manager, your second ever greatest manager in some people's eyes. We won the worst Scottish Cup final that I've ever seen in my life, which was a, a, a really, really grey day. It was as if the heavens knew it wasn't a usual cup final occasion for us. Then you go into a Champions League game against a, a team that were proven to be absolutely rank rotten and you, lo and you lose 5-0. Absolutely taunt 5-0. Was that as bad a European result as a recent capitulation against Sparta Prague at home? Capitulation is a word because if you go back, not that I'd ever want to watch the game against Bratislava ever again. Uh, you have a look at that game. We were two nothing down, and we brought on Aidan Magide, who missed a sitter mm -hmm. just after he came on, and Jeremy Aliadi. Uh, Aliadi, uh, yeah. Uh, the, him, uh, him we had on loan from Arsenal, and we went for it, and we, lo and we, and we lose three great goals. Um, and Chris Sutton got a. A career changing injury that night. I think Neil Lennon need him in the eye socket. And that, that began the problems with Chris Sutton's eye injury, which would later uh, prematurely end his career. Uh, so that affected Sutton's season, that injury as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a massive change in the club in that summer. I'll just read some of the players that actually leave that season. Chris Sutton left. Mm. We have the horrendous situation with Jackie Mack, Jackie Mack Mara who was basically chased the wolves. And then phoned whilst he was in the car on the way down the road. That, we didn't know what, that, 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 was, that was dreadful, just the way that whole of that. We'll uh, give you what you ask for. We'll give you what you ask for when he's going to sign for somebody else. Big Rab Douglas left. Momo Silla left. Paul Lambert left. Val Harn left. Ulrich Larson. Uh, Magnus Hedman also left. Ulrich Larson. Now, did we pay about one and a half for him from Hibs? Yes, we did. And he probably, did he play even more than, did he play less than 50 games, I would guess? Top of my head, for Celtic? Probably less than Yeah. Played in the FA Cup final. That's scary. So, Fernandez was on the bench. Mm -hmm. Well, Fernandez left film. that, did I say Fernandez? No, I didn't. He left that season as well to Dundee United. Mm -hmm. But all the players that I listed there, all left for nothing. All left on free transfers. So, the downsizing. The downsizing was, was really, evident. Really, was really, really beginning. Yep. So that season, and th th we're not just talking about the summer here, that season we brought in Mark Wilson for half a million pounds from Dundee United, a certain Mr Keane from Man United in that January, a Chinese international superstar called Du Wei on loan, a Paul Telfer from Southampton for 200 grand, Adam Virgo, Brighton, one and a half million, the absolute genius, which was Nakamura for two and a half million. Zarafsky, two and a half. Now, Arthur Boric was a strange one because we brought him in on loan initially and we signed him permanently for just under a million pounds in October. Mm -hmm. I forgot about that. It wasn't until I was researching this. That because it, that weren't he, Arsenal about to dive in and sign him on a permanent is deal? That, is that what it was? Yeah. I, didn't, I, didn't, I didn't dive in too, too much in it, but I just found that... I'd forgot about that, that he was initially on loan, eh? Mm. Uh, Kamara, 
uh, and also Dion Dublin. We got Dion Dublin in the, the January from Leicester City. Yeah, well. yeah. So that shows you the massive amount of change that happened that that season. Now, after Bratislava, we had to pick ourselves up because we'd be, that was us out of Europe. There wasn't any fallback into the, the UEFA Cup or the Europa League. It was that, that was us out of Europe at that point. So it's probably, it's probably for the best that we maybe did go out of Europe because we could focus concentration on the league and bedding in a new team. What's often, o- what's often overlooked for me about that season is how good Sean Maloney was. Mm-hmm. Sean Maloney was utterly excellent in that season. More remember Nakamura and Zaraski had a decent season as well, but Sean Maloney was the main man that season. When Sean Maloney left, was it two seasons after that, to Aston Villa, mm-hmm. I was devastated when Maloney left because he was the main player for Gordon Stratton in that first season. He was he was a wee dynamic dynamo mm-hmm. a player. Mm-hmm. Um, one of, I think he's been one of the best players that we've produced, but injuries and the fact that he left and he came back and his second spell wasn't as great as his first spell probably taints our, our memory of Sean Maloney in a Celtic jersey. But if you think of the 2005-2006 Sean Maloney, that was peak, peak Maloney. Would you have him back as a coach? See this question? Um, right now? Right now. Well, we've just spoken. If, we, if we can't get the, the dream team in Martinez and Maloney, would you bring Maloney back in as a coach? He's highly, highly rated. I'm not saying he's going to leave Belgium again. Mm-hmm. But. He, Maloney is highly, highly rated with those in the coaching game. And he did start at Celtic. So if there was a, if there was a change going to happen in the coaching staff, then I would maybe ask him, if, see if he would want to come back. Maybe not as a manager. He would maybe... He'd maybe come in alongside, I don't know. But you can't you can't follow Martinez to the number one international number one international country in the world and not have something about him. And as I say, I've read quite a few articles where he's really, really highly regarded in coaching circles mm-hmm. uh, through his work. Uh, I think he he's only gra- he graduated from the Johan Cruyff coaching school as well right. he went to there's some school in Barcelona that, that he's qualified from as well eh? but again if there's a change then we maybe need to be looking at some day the calibre or the potential calibre of Sean Maloney mm-hmm. to come back in but as a player that season he was magnificent absolutely magnificent for us now that season we won the league with six games to spare and we also won the league cup but it's also remembered for Bratislava and it's also remembered for Clyde. Of course it is. Yeah, also remembered for Clyde. And everybody that had their do- doubts about Gordon Strang, they two results, I don't think he ever recovered for they two results really, even though we, the following year we had, we've had two last 16s, three titles and also his final season as well. He, he went a season too far and I think... We've spoke to him and I think he would even admit that himself. He should have left that night at Tardis. Mm-hmm. Um I think the, the loss of Tommy Burns hit him quite hard. And that season, his final season, he wasn't all there mentally, I don't think. I think one of the big things that I, I do recall, th- there's the obvious high points of Strachan's tenure at the club, Kevin, and you know winning uh, the league three times in a row was, was tremendous. But... You know, getting into the Champions League last 16 twice and the teams that put us out was AC Milan and Barcelona. And it's not as though we were beating 5 nothing, 7 nothing, anything like that. Tight, tight games. AC Milan, extra time. Extra time. Uh, Kaka. What a goal. Yeah. To KC Milan, extra time with McManus, Presley and Evander Snow on the pitch. Evander the commander. Yeah. He was a That's proper, he was a proper striking signing as well. I mean, was, yes. the big thing again that, and I mentioned a couple of times on the podcast, but Strachan speaks about having the option to buy Craig Bellamy when he takes over. And Bellamy had shown Celtic fans what he was capable of uh, in the games that he had played in the previous season under Martin O'Neill. However, he, he admits that that would have been his entire signing budget, um, but he was able to do deals with Nakamura, Boric and Zaraski that cost the same outlay 
as it would, of course, for Bellamy to come in. You do, you do say that, Paul, but then when you actually go through the players that we, we let everybody go for free. Mm. There was no transfer fee came in whatsoever. As you say, it was like a clearing of the decks. Yep. Going, we're going to spend, I think we spent round about £7 million pounds to rebuild that side, but we let big wages, big players go for go for nothing. Mm -hmm. And where the board maybe a bit hasty with some of the players that they let go. You mentioned the Chris Sutton injury, which could have been, but he still went to Birmingham City. Birmingham City could have gave us a fee for Chris Sutton. He spent time at Aston Villa mm -hmm. after he left Celtic. After that as well. Surely we could have got money for Headman, Val Harden, Lambert going to Livingston, I think. I think Lambert's contract was up anyway. Yeah, I think. The, thing we, the frustration really with Val Harden is we paid a big fee to bring him in mm -hmm. and, and then you go for, for free. The thing with Hedman, I think we were just delighted to get him off the wages because he was on some of the highest wages at the club at that time. It would have been. It would have been. Signing him for Chelsea, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. um, so you can understand why, or was it Coventry we signed him from? He, he ended up at Chelsea. He ended That's up what at it was. Chelsea. Right? He went to Chelsea. Yeah. Currently he ended up with so th these guys had to go off the wage bill. Sutton um, and Strachan didn't get on. The aforementioned McGeady and Strachan didn't get on. Didn't get on. Um, so yeah, he was he was certainly getting a lot of the high earners off the wage bill, wasn't he? Another player who would have been a high earner and didn't kick a ball for us really, Stephen Henshaw. Mm -hmm. He he went to Wigan uh, that summer as well. That was another bizarre Martin O'Neill signing as well. Bizarre to Liverpool. I always remember Honshu and Michael Gray, yes. you know, um, Henri Kamara. Got so, the, you know, the last season under O'Neill, the last period, you, you don't think about that when you think of O'Neill's tenure. You think about the you know, the glorious um, first season, the treble, Seville. You think of Lennon and Thompson and Sutton. and That's what you think of. But there was another side to O'Neill's tenure. That last season for me, Bellamy was dragging us over the line. Mm -hmm. that, that team was done. And O'Neill, when he looks back, and I think he maybe admits it now, that, that he was too loyal to certain players in that team. And what was coming was maybe the right time for him to bail because he couldn't get the big names, the men that he would have wanted to build another side. Uh, the money wasn't there anymore. Um, and I think Stratton was, well, it's been proved that he was the right man to come in and manage that downsizing. Well, you know, history does prove uh, that he was the right man, Kevin, because I know a lot of people weren't keen on Gordon Strachan. And even looking back, they weren't keen on the brand of football that we produced under Gordon Strachan. I found it interesting when I was reading his book that um, he was very, very close to being Liverpool manager. Now, let me check, was it Julie or Benitez that got the job at the time? But Strachan was interviewed for the job. And he was very close to getting the Liverpool job. Um, and that was when he was doing fairly well, I think, at Southampton. So then he comes to Celtic. So obviously there was the... He had the pedigree of being a, a fairly... I say successful, I mean, I'm not talking in trophies, but no, fairly yeah. successful manager down Southampton south. Southampton to an FA Cup final. Yeah. They got beat off Arsenal, eh? He was, he, he was doing well with Southampton mm -hmm. at that time. He had done well with Coventry mm. before that as well. And as I say, I wasn't one of these fans who were up in arms that he was coming in. I thought, I think he is a safe pair of hands. But the naivety of youth, I didn't realise how big a rebuilding job was going to come up was that, that, that season, eh? And it was a massive rebuilding job. And the club, that's the lowest I've ever felt watching Celtic was that Black Sunday. And I vowed to myself that I would never let myself be affected by a game of football like that ever again. Because that was no natural for an adult to feel that low over a game of football. But football does that to you. I Celtic know. do that to you. I know, I know. You know? Um, and when you're looking at the rebuilding job or the downsizing job, stroke rebuilding job, one of the players I'm pretty sure Strachan was looking to offload but never quite could was Bobo Baldi. Again, big, big earner. Um, did he play many games in Strachan's first season? I would need to check that because I no, know there was a, a long period that. where he refused to play him. I remember that he came back in at Tannadice one game. And the, I was in, Man of the match. I, I was in the travel and support that then. What a reception that we gave him. Eh? Um, but again, that was that was O'Neill's last season, giving Baldy that contract for that six months. Mm -hmm. 
which put them on enormous wages and we just couldn't shift. Uh, is, that, is that the you get the story? Eh? Bobo didn't have an agent because Bobo Baldy looked after Bobo Baldy's best interests. Mm-hmm. I think that, I think he told Peter Law all that when he went in to speak to him. Eh? Yeah, there, yep. that's so the club is in like turmoil really when Stratton takes over, and we have two major embarrassments in his first season. Well, no embarrass, embarrassments football wise, but we still won the league with six games to spare. Mm-hmm. It shows you how poor a Rangers team that was, that we managed to downsize on such a sc- sc- scale and still won that league with six games to spare. It wasn't even as if the fact that it got took to the last game the previous season, O'Neill's season, was down to us, was down to the fact that we were an aging side. Mm-hmm. And not to win that league, looking back on it, is utterly criminal. Against We're talking this season that the Celtic Rangers games could play a major factor in where the league title is going to go. Rangers couldn't have beat us that season. They hadn't beat us in seven games. We had the, we had the hex over um, Alex McLeish's Rangers side and they still managed to win the league. So it was it was a bad time for the Celtic fans, but my catching the butterfly moment here, I don't know if you want to go into the comments and, uh, and then, we'll, then we'll go to my completely wild... Your yes. wild sliding doors moment. Yes. Uh, from Facebook, there's confirmation that Strachan's first season, he played Baldy quite a bit along with McManus. It was after Caldwell signed in his second season that he disappeared. And, oh. you know, a few times on the podcast, we've mentioned the partnership that Strachan favoured in the central defensive area being Caldwell and McManus. That became like his, his kind of staple diet at the back and uh, unfancied. But I do remember when Strachan left and in comes Mowbray. And, you know, he didn't play McManus and he didn't play Caldwell. And at that time, McManus was the captain. Caldwell was Scotland's player of the year. It took us a wee while to find a central defensive partnership that, that gelled after that. It probably took us until Van Dijk and Denier. Mm-hmm. Not that I'm comparing no, no, them can't, can't to compare McManus them and Caldwell. No, no, no. I've merely used them in the same sentence. Caldwell and McManus suited Gordon Stratton Celtic. Mm-hmm. They'd done the job for Gordon Stratton Celtic, as did Nakamura. That one outstanding flair player and a team of getting back to basics. They done they, they worked as a team. Mm-hmm. Gordon Stratton built them as a team. And sometimes you have to be more in the sum of your parts. And Stratton done that on many occasions with the Celtic team. But eventually it did fall down. Have you been wondering where Gary Doonan is on these broadcasts? Yes, I So have I. No, he's never been away. His name's disappeared from his Facebook profile. Oh, Sorry about that, Gary. I thought you'd uh, disagreed with many of the points I make. A lot of people do. Um, no, welcome back. Uh, I think there's a registration process you go through on StreamYard that allows you to show your avatar and your name. So your your comments account. are always welcome on a Celtic State of Mind, that's for sure. But uh, yes, I mean, some of these players, as you say, were unfancy, but they'd done a job. You know, it, and it was very like, much back to basics, hard working and all this. But a lot of players I've spoken to from that era say that there was nothing like a pre-season under Gordon Strachan in terms of the intensity. He was very focused on the the conditioning and the fitness back then, Mm -hmm. which is massive when you think about how the game has evolved even since the time of Strachan. He was always into fitness. He played till he was 39, eh? Mm. So he was always one for fitness and being a model professional because he was one himself. Yeah. So I'm not surprised that his pre-seasons were intense. You know why he was teetotal during his time uh, as a footballer, though? It was he wasn't night, always teetotal. It was a night teetotal. out with Jimmy Johnson. <laughs> a night out with Jimmy Johnson. <laughs> when he was at Dundee. Aye. And uh, he knew that it was either he gave up the drink or he got a divorce, so he decided to give up the baby. I, th- I think he likes a glass of red wine now, now that he's retired. His 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 wife always looks so happy sitting alongside him when he when he gets pictured at the football games. Um, and a great wee night out, Gordon and his wife go to the football. Eh? Or they go to a James gig. Yes, I. AJSC Technology Videos um, makes a point here: no youth development under Martin O'Neill. Negligent. Now, I do remember speaking to Stephen Sullivan, who wrote the fantastic Sean Farland biography, uh, Celtic's Iron Man. And obviously, during O'Neill's time at the club, Stephen was working for the Celtic View, wasn't he? Mm-hmm. And I, I had that chat actually with Stephen, and he was re- referencing Willie McStay in this because Willie was involved with youth development at Celtic. And they were talking about the, the youth players that came through under Martin O'Neill. Um, I mean, when you think of some of the, 
players that he introduced. Obviously, he introduced Aidan McGeady, didn't he? Mm -hmm. um, Ross Wallace came in through O'Neill. Uh, Craig, Craig Beatty. Now, again, I know a lot of other fans don't like Craig Beatty, but he was a player we brought through. We ended up selling for one and a quarter million, didn't we? To West Brom. Jamie Smith. There was a clutch of young players that came through. David Marshall. Did Marshall come through under yes, O'Neill? So there was a clutch of players that came through um, under O'Neill. But I do take your point because there's another manager that I would say was not interested in bringing youth players through at Celtic, but he was a success. It was Vim Janssen. Mm -hmm. He came in, he wasn't interested because that's not why he was there. He was there to win the league and then he was off ski after that. But uh, what, how did you rate O'Neill in terms of the youth development aspect? Did he give Maloney's debut? He would have given Maloney's there's debut. Another I, I, there's another one. There's another one. Yeah. Three nothing one. At and he would have given. He would have given McManus's debut. Give, uh, he did give Ten McManus. Castle. He was did. it? Uh huh. Yep. So I, I think there was a few no, under O'Neill. No, remember he played a team of kids at Ten Castle in a League Cup game. Yeah. I Craney. Think, uh, Stephen Craney played that night. I think the bottom line is O'Neill. O'Neill trusted men. If you look at the the dressing room that he was brought up in, the Nottingham Forest dressing room. He went out with guys who he knew he could trust. Mm -hmm. And until the young fellas gave him that reasoning to trust him, then, I mean, Petroff was still a young lad. Here's another couple of names. Sorry to interrupt there, Money Kevin. Hustle. But uh, Philip DeMarco um, is throwing John Kennedy and uh, Kennedy. also Colin Healy, massively Aye. rated player. Liam Miller. Liam Miller. Liam Miller. There, was a f there was quite a few, actually, now when you I start know. listing them. Mm -hmm. Quite a few players came through under O'Neill. That, that's testament to William McStay's work mm -hmm. at Celtic at that time. Oh, definitely. But I think Martin always favoured the more... Simon Lynch. Yeah, Simon. they just keep coming. Mm -hmm. No, wait a minute. Simon Lynch made his debut under Kenny Dalglish against Dundee United in uh, the last and, game. Him and Maloney argued about a penalty kick at I remember Castle. that, aye. So, they were both on a hat-trick. Aye, that's mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. So I think Martin did favour the more older professional player because you look at the guys that he signed. Mm -hmm. Basically, that that's what he liked. But the, there was a few youngsters did get their chance when you when you look back yeah. on it. Mm -hmm. And the, I mean, Maloney got his debut in two thousand and one, the treble season. So this season that I'm talking about, when he's been absolutely excellent, he's been in and around the first team for four or five years. Uh, in and around the first team, he play, he's played in a UEFA Cup final. Mm -hmm. So my moment. My change, my catching the butterfly right. moment. Unless you've got another comment. No, I've, give I've, us, just, it. Give us right. your sliding doors moment. Right. Black Sunday never happens. Craig Bellamy manages to score one of his many one-on-ones against Gordon Marshall at third part that day. <sighs> and we go 2 nothing up. Or Hartson scores or probably Hartson an scored, easier chance, yeah. Right. So we win the league. Martin still leaves because that was that was... Um, his wife and the, the, his caring responsibilities with, with that we still won the S Scottish Cup the following week winning that league gets us into the, the setting round of qualifying mm -hmm. for the Champions League this kicks the board in because they don't need to downsize as much and to keep the fans on side they do sign Bellamy Bellamy forces a move for Newcastle to Celtic for a cup price fee Okay, not a I think it was so five to six or something. Five to six million, yeah. but he takes a cut in wages to come to Celtic because he's got two winners medals. He's enjoyed it that much. He wants to come back up. We never meet Bratislava. Rangers finish second. They meet Bratislava, and get the same result as what we got. Right. So instead of meeting Bratislava, we play who Rangers played in the third qualifying round, which was Famagusta. So we end up putting out Fama Gusta and getting into the Champions League. Now, Rangers group that season in the Champions League was an OK Inter Milan side, our old friends Armita Bratislava mm. and Porto. OK, so there wasn't, there wasn't, a, wasn't a decent Porto team. Rangers got out of that group with seven points. We would have had a front pairing of John Hartson and uh, Craig Bellamy. At who had a point, partnership we under Strack in, uh, in Coventry. Uh, Coventry. Yeah. And an on-fire Sean Maloney. Okay? Mm -hmm. So you've got to say, we, if Rangers got out of that group with seven points, we would have got out of that group. Rangers got beat with Villarreal in the last 16. I'm not going any further in the last 16. So what I'm actually saying there is... Did, did Forlan score? He might have done. Diego Forlan. 
So what I'm actually saying is, if we had a sign, Black Sunday never happens, we sign Craig Bellamy, Gordon Stratton gets us to three last 16s in a row in the Champions League. Mm. Okay? Mm. We win the league, as usual, but we also win the treble because Clyde never happens because we've got Bellamy. Okay? And how do we win the treble? Who who did Clyde play after the Betters? Rangers. Gretna. All right. Who got to the final that mm, year? I remember it. Gretna. Mm. So Gretna bet Clyde, then they bet St. Murn at Dundee, then they met Hearts in the final. He would have, he would have fancied us to beat every one of the teams. So I'm saying if Black Sunday never happens, we sign Craig Bellamy, we won the treble in the last 16 of the Champions League the following season. And you never have that gut wrenching moment of a football have that game. Gut wrenching moment that haunts you to this game. day. And this completely changes our view of Gordon Stratton's reign on Celtic. What is your overview, overall view? Looking back, what is your overall view on Gordon it's Stratton? The season too long. Mm. The, the, the football went for about eighteen months, and the last the title we won at Tannadice was down to his tactical change of bringing in Barry Robson and Paul Hartley yeah. in the centre of midfield and dropping Scott Brown. They got us over the line, but he went a season too far. He did, right. go, a, he did go a season. I'd too agree far. with that. A couple of wee things I've picked up um, over the years, speaking to various people around Strachan and Gordon Strachan himself, was that uh, I remember a conversation between Paddy McCourt and Gordon Strachan and they were talking about Carl McGregor and McGregor was a very, very young player and he had been invited to train with the first team and Paddy McCourt was going about how impressed he was with Carl McGregor coming at the first team as a young, young boy and I know he didn't make his debut until Ronnie Dyla much later but as a young boy coming in and the way that he equipped himself and he was singing his praises and the other player that Paddy mentioned uh, who showed up really, really well was Islam Farouz Mm-hmm. And at that, Strachan said that it was the best 300 grand Celtic had ever made when he went to Chelsea. Because he could see the problems coming with Islam Farouz, mm-hmm. even as a young kid. And I found that really interesting because normally you look at Islam Farouz, you think, you know, and hopefully we're, we're not speaking about Karamoko Dembele in the same terms in years to come. But you think, ah, you know, if, what if, it's one of the moments you're just talking about. Mm-hmm. Uh, what if... Farouz had stayed what if we had developed him but Strachan said he was never ever going to make it at Celtic so that was an interesting take from Gordon Strachan Mm -hmm. Um, now the the Scottish Cup final when we beat them firm on 1-0 and um, Perrier Doumbé scores the winning goal and you know the only ever Celtic player with two hyphens in his name incredible start that incredible bit of trivia but he doesn't speak well of Gordon Strachan he says that Strachan ruined his football career which was an interesting take on it as well. Interesting comment. Eh? Mm. But then football players are going to say that if, some, get if on you with don't some achieve, man, if you don't achieve, you get on with some managers. You don't get on with other managers. There's I think some it was manager. Was it not injury? He was forced to play when he, he said he was injured, and then it required surgery and it put him out and all this kind of stuff. It was fairly recently. There's an there is an interview online where he criticises Gordon Strachan. But um, no, I like these moments, Kevin, where you take us into the realms of your mindset and uh, what might have been. But around about that time, of course, there was a, a, a seminal album being released by a friend of a Celtic state of mind, uh, Edgar Summertime Jones Jones, depending on what moniker he takes, because um, he has released a lot of albums. So a wee introduction about Edgar Summertime before you go into the album you're going to talk about. He released uh, Soothing Music for Stray Cats on the 9th of May 2005 on the uh, Viper label, which is an independent Liverpoolian label. The album was later called by No Gallagher. Um, the quote is, It bent my head, man. It's probably one of the best records I have ever heard, which was an interesting quote from No. My own take on it is that had Thelonious Monk employed Captain Beefheart to sing on a soundtrack to Kerouac's On The Road, then Jay Katz would have been the result. That's how I commented on the album. Now, if you don't know who Edgar Jones is, he was the front man with The Stairs, who brought out an album in the early 90s called Mexican R&B. Uh, the lead singles, uh, some of which were Weed Boss, Mary Joanna, you get the vibe of that album. Um, he was also the front man of The Joneses, Free Peace, The Israites, and The Pig Kids. Uh, the Big Kids, not The Pig Kids. Uh, six solo LPs, one LP with Free Peace, one LP with The Stairs. And he's also played with Ian McCulloch, The Laz, St Etienne, Ocean Colour Scene, Paul Weller, Johnny Marr, Johnny Eccles from Love, 
and Cherry Ghost. And yes, he was the star of our first unplugged session for A State of Mind. So if you've not seen that on YouTube, go and have a watch because the guy is a bona fide genius. Um, talk to us about soothing music for Stray Cats, Kev. Edgar recorded this album after he finished touring with Paul Weller. He used the money, money that he got touring with Paul Weller to record this album in his bedroom on an eight track that John M. R. gave him. Um, this is basically, the album is basically a mushroom trip in his record collection. And in a classic songwriting tradition that Liverpool's got, a, a guy whose brain is made to create music, eh? It's an album that's out of step with everything that was released in 2005. It shouldn't have been released in 2005, it should have been released in 1963. It's like, it's got that Liverpool feel, but it feels like the Mersey's been drained and it's been replaced by the Deltas of New Orleans and Edgar's down there walking barefoot, letting the, letting the spirit and the soul of New Orleans come through come through his feet and up, up into him. I mean, it's a it's a, a jazz album for folk that didn't like jazz, really. It's uh, It's got rock and roll on it, it's got doo-wop, it's got funk, it's got everything there that's out of step in 2005. I gave my copy away, I've just had to buy a new one this week, but you know who I gave it to? Yeah. Andrew Innes out of Primal Scream. Did you? Mm -hmm. It's an album that's loved by other musicians. And his wife's a big jazz fan, so I thought I'd better give my Edgar Jones's album. It's this the album. The album's a kind of album that I picture the mods listening to in nineteen sixty London. Mm -hmm. That's the timeless sound that it's got, and see how all these sort of mod revivalists appear during the the Britpop era. Eh? I always say mods when they've been listening to the Britpop stuff, they would have been listening to this album by Edgar Jones yeah. if they were following the right mod tradition. Eh? Um, as you say, saying, Noel Gallagher called it one of the greatest albums that he's, that he's ever heard. It is a fantastic album, but not an album that will immediately jump out of you. You've got to learn it. It's that many styles. It's just, it's a timeless album. It's one of these albums, if I played it to you now, and say, guess what year that was released, you wouldn't guess. There's a few Edgar's albums like that, isn't there? You would not guess what year it was, um, it was released there, eh? and... It's fantastic. He's, he's one of these guys where luck has just sort of evaded him at times. Uh, he's always been just brewing under the radar of commercialism. Uh, uh, but look at who he's worked with. Look who's asked him to play on tours player. and on records. Um, and again, Edgar is working on his seventh solo album. Um, I think anyone who is interested in doing a bit of digging would be best placed to go and by the Stairs three album um, anthology from Cherry Red Records, which is out there. I think it's about 13, 14 quid, 70 songs on it. And there's another anthology with all his solo work coming out in January, another 70 songs. And when you listen to it, you probably think it's a number of different artists. It sound, it will sound like a compilation of loads of garage bands, jazz bands, soul bands, blues bands. Kevin, it's incredible how he's able to transcend all these genres on uh, one record. Definitely, he's a musician's musician, as you've actually says. And this is my catching the, the butterfly moment for Edgar, as Souvenir Music for Stray Cats was on the big list for the Mercury Music Prize. Mm -hmm. It didn't make the short list when you see it, when you actually see that Hard Fi made the short list for the Mercury Music Prize that year. You just wonder what the judges were actually thinking because Hard Fi were absolute dug. They were, they were rubbish. They were duck. Aye, they were duck. They were duck meat. Stop short. Duck meat, all right. Dug meat, aye. So, uh, what I'm saying is, Edgar makes that short list for the Mercury Music Prize mm -hmm. and wins. He wins it. The, the, the judges have an epiphany and go, this man's a genius. This album deserves to get blown up. So the album blows up. So I've all, 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 always says, I've just says there that Edgar is a musician's musician. So, 2005, Hug Money 2005, Edgar is playing the bass with Jules Holland on his Hoot and Annie. Playing, playing stuff. He has been on Jules Holland, by the way. He, he's playing stuff for that, that year's biggest album, Souvenir Music for Stray Cats. Now, it will only be a commercial success, this album, but it'll be a, a bigger success than what it was. So he's on Hoot and Annie playing with the 
what's Joe Holland's blue, blues band playing, whatever they're doing, they're do what, because Edgar would fit into that, Edgar can play that. So he gets his career as, what I'm trying to think about, maybe Richard Holly size, where every album releases sells, sell, sells 100,000, 200,000 copies. He sells out places like the Barrowlands, but it still gives him that artistic freedom to do what he wants. To never sell out. Ne never sell out, experiment. But because he's got that kudos of the industry backing, he can do that and it gets him to a new audience. So he gets a great solo career, but I can actually see him just now. If Edgar had won that Mu Mercury Music Prize, if he had won it right at this precise moment in time, he would have a Radio 6 Sunday afternoon show called Summertime Sundays. Because he would be <laughs> that critically acclaimed. And he'd be sitting there delving into his record collection every Sunday on Radio 6. Six music. Kevin, I just love the way your brain works. Um, no, that was brilliant. And by the way, Edgar deserves all the success that he ever gets. And I'm hoping that his next album is a wee breakthrough moment for him as well because he's he's had highs and lows over the last wee while as well, Kevin. Um, and he's a, as I say, he's actually a friend of the show. So um, he did come and visit us up at the, the studio and hopefully... And in fact, he played live for us, didn't he? At one of our very, very early shows at uh, the Poetry Club in Glasgow. Mm -hmm. um, and he's, he's friendly with Jim Lambie and he's friendly with all these people. But he'll never ask for a gig. So, you know, when it came down to playing uh, bass for No Gallagher's High Flying Birds, Edgar's name was all over that job, but he wouldn't ask for it. And it's quite weird that the guy who got the bass job was in a band with Edgar. He was, he was in the Big Kids, it was, it was kids, uh, right? Ross Pritchard. Uh -huh. So yeah, check out Edgar Summertime Jones, check out the session he did for us on our YouTube channel. If you're watching this on the YouTube channel, get subscribing, uh, we'll try to push it up to 5,000 by the end of the year. And we'll be giving away some prizes, we've got a few prizes that people have sent in as well, uh, to anyone who subscribes. Thanks everybody for getting involved, and welcome back Gary Doonan, although you've never been away, I've not seen your name popping up for a while. Uh, and all that's left for me to say is Kevin Graham, thank you once again for joining me on Scream Acelica by a Celtic State of Mind. Thank you very much.